Welcome everyone uh, to this presentation on uh, the BOOD-10 or BOOD-X as we like to call them, the periodic cicadas. Um, the hosts for this webinar are Women for the Land and the Indiana Forestry and Woodland Owners Association. My name is Heather Bacher and I'm the coordinator for the Women for the Land initiative. And our group empowers and supports women in Indiana to learn about implementing conservation uh, and good management practices on their land, whether it be farmland, forest, or their backyard garden. Um, to learn more about us, I hope you'll visit our website that's there on the screen. And I'd like to introduce our other host, Liz Jackson. I did it. Welcome everyone. My name is Liz Jackson. I'm, I'm the executive director of the Indiana Forestry and Woodland Owners Association. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us today. Our organization assists woodland owners at meeting their objectives on their land, whatever that might be, from timber management to wildlife habitat to any other thing that's of interest to them on their land. So we provide resources to help them be successful. I'll put some information in the chat box for you about Indiana Woodland Owners if you'd like to learn more. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. So today we have two great presenters. Um, we have um, each presenter is going to share a presentation and then we'll have a question period following that. Um, many of you submitted questions in advance, so I hope we'll be able to answer all of those. But uh, if you have other questions or th something comes up as you're uh, watching our presenters, please share in the chat box that question and Liz and I will um, share it with everyone and ask the presenters to answer. So we'll go ahead with our first presenter. That's Dr. Elizabeth Barnes. She's an ex uh, the exotic forest pest educator with the Department of Entomology at Purdue. She received her doctorate in ecology from the University of Denver, where she specialized in plant insect interactions. But she's been doing research on insects ever since her days at Mount Holyoke College, where she studied the impact of invasive plants on um, everybody's favorite, our monarch, monarch caterpillars. She currently works on science communication and invasive species outreach. So Elizabeth, we'll turn it over to you and let you start your presentation. And um, thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. My cat has very poor timing. Um, there we go. All right. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about the entomology side of the 17 year cicada emergence. Uh, and I'm going to start with some general background on cicada biology. So these insects have a 17 year long life cycle, most of which is spent underground. They feed on tree roots while they're underground, um, but they're not actually chewing up the roots. They're just basically drinking from those tree roots. So they're not causing damage to the roots in that case. When they um, get to be close to that 17 year, uh, end of that 17 year long life cycle, they will um, crawl up to the surface and wait to emerge until it's about 64 degrees in the soil. Um, and that's usually in May to June. And then they wait until just after a warm rain to actually come out and molt and emerge. Um, and we're, we're expecting that May to June, but it might be a little bit earlier or a little bit later, kind of depending on the weather. And it's going to be a different emergence time um, throughout the state because, you know, the bottom of Indiana gets warmer sooner than the top of Indiana. Uh, now, I've also shown on the side of the screen here a cicada mid-molt. Um, they need to be on a vertical surface when they actually molt because their bodies are really, really soft and they need to climb up somewhere where they can really just hang their wings down to let them expand and, and stay open until they've actually hardened. Um, we're expecting up to 1.5 million cicadas to um, emerge per acre in some of the really dense locations. So this is going to be event, an event that's going to be hard to ignore in, in some of the areas where they're coming out. 
after they emerge, the males climb up into the trees and they sing their heads off to try and attract a mate. Uh, the females will click their wings in response, and it actually sounds like snapping your fingers, uh, which means you can do this kind of fun trick where if you find a male cicada, you can snap your fingers along a branch and the cicada will follow you. It'll, it'll go back and forth. You can even snap your fingers on your shoulder or your hat and get the cicada to jump up on there and hang out for a little while. So you can you know, make a cicada friend that way. The After they've mated, the females will lay their eggs in the branches. Uh, their ovipositors are actually like a, a really big needle or almost like a little sword. So when they um, actually stab it into the branch, that's where you see the damage from cicadas, which uh, Dan will talk to you more about later. So I won't go into too much detail, but that's how they actually cause that damage. Um, after they've laid their eggs, the eggs will stay in the branch for anywhere from about, you know, a month to uh, eight weeks, then they'll hatch out, the nymphs will drop to the ground, um, and they will be pounced upon by um, spiders and other little predators that live in the uh, detritus under the trees. Um, so you see a significant amount of cicada mortality at that point. But the ones that survive burrow down into the soil. Uh, in their first few instars, they feed on tree roots, or excuse me, on um, things like grass roots. And then when they get bigger, they move on to those tree roots and the whole cycle repeats again. So where are we actually going to see them? Well, um, brood axis actually has a really huge distribution across the country. As you can see, it extends um, all the way to the East Coast and uh, down south um, as far as Tennessee and um, even into, um, you see there's there are some broods near Atlanta down there too. Um, in Indiana, we're going to see most of these cicadas in the southern part of the state, even though they can be found anywhere throughout Indiana. Um, and the reason for this is because in large part of changing land use patterns over the years, cicadas need to be feeding constantly while they are underground. And if you take away a tree, even for a year, even if you replant trees right afterwards, the cicadas can't survive. So they will die in the soil at that point. Um, and so you can kind of, it, it's interesting if you look at where cicadas have historically been, you can almost see where land use patterns are changing over the years based on where the cicadas are emerging. Um, cicadas also can't travel very far either as adults or as nymphs. Um, so when they're uh, nymphs underground, if you remove the tree, again, they can't exactly go just find another tree. Um, and when they're adults, it takes them a really long time to uh, recolonize an area that has had trees replanted in it because they can only fly around 50 meters, even as adults. They've got, you know, they've got these big, huge wings. You would think that they would be really good flyers, um, but no, they're, they're really heavy. They're pretty lazy. They're not going to go far from where where they initially uh, emerge. All right, so what can you actually expect for this emergence? Um, the first thing you're probably gonna notice are these mud chimneys. Uh, what these are, are when the cicadas first come up to the surface, they build these tunnels and they kind of push out the mud and it creates these almost little towers. And I've got a picture of one of them down in the corner of the screen there. And if you look inside them, you can sometimes actually see the cicadas just waiting for the temperature to be right and for that warm rain to happen so they can emerge. Um, I actually took these pictures just this past weekend in Lafayette. So the ones here are getting ready. Don't think they're going to come out this week because it's been, you know, it's, it's pretty cold today for a cicada uh, and it's supposed to remain pretty cold for the rest of the week. But I would say we seem to be on track for that early May emergence. The next thing you'll notice is after the cicadas emerge, they leave behind these shells, which are called exuvia. Um, and they are absolute perfect replica of what the cicada nymph looked like, um, minus the typical coloration of that nymph. Um, you can see here on, you know, it's on its, well, nose, uh, these little hairs. So it even preserves those. Um, and because of this, sometimes people get them confused and they think that these are living insects when really it's only that exoskeleton that's remaining. It's not alive. Uh, you can actually pick it up once it's hardened and um, you can look at it under a microscope. You can save it. 
I have um, Exuvia from Dragonflies that I collected back in high school that I've still got in a, a chocolate box because <laughs> that's what I had to use back then. Um, so you can keep them for a very long time. And something interesting that I always like to point out to people is often you can see these little like stringy white things on their backs around where uh, the back cracked open. And you might think, you know, it's just a piece of like the fluff or something that got caught on the exuvia. But what that actually is, is it's the lung system of the insect. So insects have, uh, they breathe through tracheal tubes that um, go into their body, but they're connected to the outside exoskeleton. It's all connected together. And so when they molt and they shed that um, shell, they need to molt basically their lungs too. So you get, in addition to the whole body in a perfect cast, you get the lungs as well remaining on that uh, exuvia. All right, back to this actual emergence, what you're all here for. Um, the other big thing you will probably notice is the sound. They are very, very loud because there are so many of them. Uh, they are going to only sing during the day. Luckily, they get quiet at night. Um, the uh, You might hear something that you think sounds like a cicada at night, and it will be one of two things. It's either um, a cicada that was startled because they'll often make a noise when they're startled, or it might be a um, another insect or sometimes even frogs can be confused with cicadas. Uh, so that's probably what you're hearing. Uh, the loudest time for the cicadas is going to be uh, mid-afternoon. In the morning, they're sort of warming up. And then the afternoon, that's when they start really singing at their loudest. Um, also, once the cicadas die, they sort of act like a fertilizer in many ways. So their bodies are packed full of nutrients that um, once the cicadas decay and it gets into the soil, um, can give um, some plants and even the trees a little bit of a boost. Now, this whole cicada plant system is, it's very, it's quite complicated um, and there are upsides and downsides to the cicadas that I'm not gonna get into today. But if anyone's interested, I can um, share more detailed information. There are some really interesting studies out there that looked at the impact of cicadas um, on the growth of trees. Um, and animals are not missing out on the fun either. So any animal that can eat a cicada is going to eat a cicada. That includes everything from, um, you know, birds to fish to raccoons and mice. Um, anything that can gobble them up is going to gobble them up and have a huge feast. So um, it, I'm excited to see that. There are some upsides and downsides for us to that. I'll give you a couple examples. So Downside, we expect to see a boom in the population of mice and rats because a well-fed mouse is able to have more baby mice. Downs or the upside is that things like turkeys will also get much more plump because they'll be eating so many cicadas in the spring. So you'll get some extra plump turkeys come this fall at Thanksgiving, thanks to the cicadas. Which brings us to people eating cicadas. Yes, you can eat cicadas. Uh, there is a very long history of people eating cicadas. There's some great recipe books out there for them. You can, you know, roast them, you can fry them, you can boil them. Uh, basically, uh, a good sort of rule of thumb is, is basically anything you can do to a shrimp, you can also do to a cicada. Um, but a couple warnings. First, if you have a shellfish allergy, you are probably also allergic to cicadas and other insects, so you want to avoid eating them. Uh, that's because um, shellfish and insects are actually closer related to each other than you might think, and they have a lot of the um, same things in their bodies that are allergens um, in shellfish are also in the bodies of insects and are allergens, and so you, you may have a reaction because of that. The second thing is when you're gathering cicadas, don't gather the dead ones to eat. Uh, you don't know why they died. You don't know how long they've been there. They may seem you know, much easier for you to grab, um, but you wanna avoid those. And then also related to that, um, you wanna be careful where you're getting them and kind of be aware of what the pesticide history is in the area. Um, if, if, for example, you don't wanna accidentally eat a cicada that's been you know, feeding on a tree that's been treated with a systemic insecticide because the cicada will also inject the insecticide. And then if you eat a bunch of the cicadas, you might get sick. Um, so just kind of as a whole, 
you know, enjoy the cicadas, enjoy eating cicadas, but be cautious when you do it with any wild caught food. Um, and keep in mind, I am an entomologist, so I can tell you about the cicadas themselves, but I'm not a doctor. So if you eat a cicada and you don't feel good, you know, doctors are the people you want to consult about it, not, not the entomologist. And lastly, if eating bugs doesn't really sound like something that's up your alley, um, we also have an alternative for you. So uh, Purdue Entomology is running a cookie decorating contest. We've got a bunch of cool prizes for that. Um, we're just asking people to decorate a cookie so it looks like a cicada. You can do any life stage, um, any way you want it, and uh, send it in to us and you'll be entered to win some prizes. So. Moving on, I want to address some common questions and concerns about cicadas and the cicada emergence. To start with, um, one question I get all the time is, isn't this something that happens every year? Why is this such a big deal this year? Um, which is true and not true at the same time. So we do get cicadas every year, but we get annual cicadas every year. And these uh, insects come out in August. Uh, they look very different from the 17 year cicadas. They're much more green. They're a little bit larger. Um, whereas the 17 year cicadas have these beautiful golden wings and bright red eyes and dark bodies. Um, and so the annual cicadas, you get some of them coming out every year, whereas the 17 year cicadas all of the cicadas in the entire species that makes up um, that there are three species of 17 year cicadas and they're all coming up at the same time in the beginning of the spring. So you can kind of think of it, it's the same thing as the difference between say, uh, you know, a Canada goose and a cardinal. They're both birds, but they behave differently. They look differently. Um, if you're a bird person, you can easily tell the difference. So it's the same with cicadas. Annual cicadas are the ones we normally get. 17 year cicadas are the ones we're getting this year. Another common question we get asked is people freak out because they think this is a plague of locusts. Um, a lot of people use cicada and locusts interchangeably, um, particularly in the Midwest. This is a big way that people use it. And I just wanna tell you, no, it's okay. Uh, they are very different insects. This is not a plague of locusts. Um, cicadas have piercing sucking mouth parts. So basically they have little straws for mouths that they stick into the trees to drink out of the trees. Whereas locusts, which are, they're basically grasshoppers have chewing mouth parts. So they actually chew up the plants and destroy the plant tissue. Um, in addition, I'm only gonna touch on this briefly because Dan will talk about it more later, but cicadas are really only feeding on deciduous trees, whereas uh, locusts will feed on a wide range of plants and including crop plants. So it's not a plague of locusts, don't worry. Uh, the two insects do very, very different types of damage. Um, so yes, we don't have a plague on our hands. Another question we get asked a lot is people worry about whether or not they're dangerous, um, but they don't bite, they don't sting, they're not poisonous. Um, but again, as I said before, if you have any sort of concerns, if your pet eat one, eats one like this, you know, cat is over at the side and then starts acting sick, or if something happens after a cicada interaction and you don't feel well, you know, always use your best judgment, um, consult with the doctor. Um, for example, some, you know, some cats can actually have allergies to cicadas as well. So that might be an issue. There's a range of issues there, but at their base, cicadas themselves don't bite, don't sting, aren't poisonous. Um, another thing people often wonder is why in the world are they so loud? How does this little insect make so much noise? Um, so, oh, that went out of order. Whoops. Um, so there, there are kind of two parts to this question. The first part is they are so loud because there are millions of these insects and each male cicada is desperately trying to get the attention of the female cicada. So they're all singing their lungs out at once, um, which leads to the second part, which is how they do this. Um, lungs are a bit of a misnomer. They don't have vocal cords like we do. They actually have this organ called a timbal on the side of their body that they contract and that's what make, makes the noise. Um, most of their abdomen is actually hollow. So it's sort of like with um, something like with a violin where you've got that hollow space 
that allows the strings of the instrument to make um, a, a louder sound. Um, with the timbal, you can think of the way it works as sort of like a, a bendy straw. So when you, you move a bendy straw back and forth, you get that sort of crunching noise. Um, that's, that's essentially what the cicadas are doing as well. That's how they're making that noise. Yep, air chamber. I don't know why that all went out of order. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, another question is, why every 17 years? It seems like a weirdly specific amount of time, um, particularly for insects to be living underground. Um, there isn't a definitive answer for this, but our best guess is it has to do with predators. And there are two parts to this. So first, by all emerging at the same time, the predators physically cannot eat all of the cicadas. They get full. And because they get full, some cicadas survive, some cicadas go on to reproduce. So it's kind of, it's, it's like overwhelming them, providing the predators with this huge buffet and they're, um, which means that yes, some of them will die, but many of them will live. The second part of this is that um, many insects, their populations are kind of kept in check in a variety of ways, including plant defenses, but a big part of it is um, top-down pressure from predators and parasitoids. And within that, um, most of the time there are um, predators or parasitoids that specialize on these insects. Um, but if you have this long 17 year long life cycle, it's much harder for anything to specialize on a 17 year cicada um, and specialize on attacking them. So in both cases, it's, um, it's a strategy to avoid predation. Uh, which brings us to cicada killers. Uh, again, uh, people are kind of worried that, oh no, we've got this huge number of cicadas. Are we going to have wasps flying everywhere now? Um, well, so cicada killers are large wasps that lay their eggs inside of cicadas, but no, you will probably not see an uptick in them this year. Uh, cicada killers have their life cycle pretty closely aligned with the annual cicadas, which are coming out in late summer. So we don't think that most of the cicada killers will be ready ready to lay eggs um, when the 17 year cicadas are out. And lastly, uh, for this section, I wanted to end with zombie cicadas. So some of you might be hearing about zombie cicadas and thinking, wait, wait, I thought you said there wasn't going to be a plague. What's going on? What are these? What in the world is a zombie cicada? Well, it is a um, cicada that's been infected by a fungus called Massospora. Uh, the fungus infects cicadas and replaces their abdomen with fungal spores. And you can see in this top image that like clump of white at the end of the cicada is actually a big mass of spores. Um, and those spores, the, that big mass of spores can even fall off like in this bottom picture. And you'll have a cicada wandering around, flying around entirely missing its abdomen. Um, and that's not the weirdest part. Uh, the fungus also causes a bunch of behavioral changes in cicadas. Um, there are two big ones that it does. Uh, the first is that it will produce essentially a stimulant, which forces the cicada to stay active and stay wandering around. Because you can imagine if, if you lost essentially half of your body, you probably wouldn't be interested in being up and you know running around and flying all around. Um, so this stimulant keeps them moving. And the second thing it does is in male cicadas, it will actually cause them to respond to the calls of other male cicadas by clicking their wings like a female. Then when that second male cicada comes over and tries to mate with them, it contracts the fungal spore and spreads it further. So both of these behavioral changes promote the further spread of this fungus to other cicadas. And then um, kind of at the end of the cycle, the spores drop into the soil. They lie dormant in the soil until the next cicada emergence. So it's, it's kind of freaky. It's a little weird, um, but it's also really interesting. So I always like to share that with people. Um, all right. So what if you want to actually kind of in celebrate and enjoy the cicada emergence? We have you covered here. Um, if you go to the Purdue website on cicadas, and I have the link on here, and it's also going to be sent out to you later, we've got all sorts of resources on cicadas, um, everything from kind of fun cicada facts through um, details on how you can actually protect your trees from cicadas and our recommendations there. 
Uh, we also have this beautiful cicadas and their lookalikes poster that you can download off of our website and print out and have as a reference for when the cicadas do emerge. Um, and then finally, our virtual Bug Bowl site um, is going to stay up for a while. Bug Bowl was last week, um, and we had a whole day dedicated to cicadas. And so again, that has all sorts of you know interesting bug facts and and kind of science information, as well as some you know crafts and activities if that's what you want to do. We also have two community science programs going on around the cicadas. Uh, the first one is a little bit more time intensive. Uh, we're calling it Cicada Emergence Trackers. And for this, uh, what we're asking people to do is to monitor trees and check them every three days to look for cicadas emerging, um, and then record those emergences and send us that data. You can do it either through iNaturalist or a data sheet you email to me. And if you're interested in this, in, in, if you're interested in this, please do get in touch with me and I can send you more instructions on that. The second one is less time intensive and there's kind of a longer period when you can uh, join in. Uh, we're doing a bio blitz, which is essentially uh, a time when you go out and you try and record as much biodiversity data as you possibly can. And we decided it would be fun to do this in some of the areas where the cicadas are emerging. And it's also a great way for us to collect data about um, both the cicadas specifically and their distribution and also the um, the sort of uh, more general biodiversity data that will feed into some other projects that we're doing. Um, this is going to be held from May 1st through May 16th, so you can do it at any point during that period, as long as you want, as little as you want, um, and you'll just pick your favorite spot to get outside, go out there, take pictures of everything living that you come across, and then upload them on iNaturalist. And as long as you've joined our iNaturalist project, it'll be added to that, and you won't need to do anything after that. So just in summary, um, don't worry, if you don't like bugs, if you don't like cicadas, this is all going to be over in a month and a half. And if you do like bugs, there's a limited time to get out and enjoy this. So, you know, get out there, see the cicadas, because it won't be uh, for another 17 years until you can see them again. And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Great, Elizabeth, thanks so much. I like bugs, I'm excited. <laughs> Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is from Judy, and she wanted to know where the largest population was going to be. And she's specifically asking because she's in um, Ohio, just east of Richmond, and she's wondering about where she can take her grandchildren to experience it. Yeah, um, so I'm trying to think if there's a place closer to Ohio. Um, so we have a lot of, let me go back to the beginning. We have a lot of state parks in Indiana, at least are the best places to see the emergence, but it looks like there's actually um, a band of them going into Ohio. So these little cicada symbols are the areas where um, last time around in uh, 2004, we had the biggest emergence. Um, and if you go to, um, I've got the, the address down in the bottom here, but the University of Connecticut is the one who put together this map. And you can actually zoom in really close and you can kind of get a better idea of where the good cicada locations are. So I think that might be the way to go. But the, the big tips, tips I have for that are first off, um, try and think about where the oldest trees you know are. So where are the trees that have been there the longest? because that's the spot where you're more likely to see uh, a lot of cicadas. And then the other thing is, as I mentioned before, we do tend to find them more often in the southern part of Indiana. And also, as you can see, this like um, southwest corner of Ohio is the uh, area where there are larger populations of them. Great, thank you. Um, Patricia wanted to know how warm the temperatures need to be for them to start emerging. How warm does it need to be? Um, so the, the ground temperature needs to be about 64 degrees. That's, that's really the cue that they have. And then they also need that warm rain in order to get them to come out of the ground. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers the question. And you talked a little bit about pets eating um, cicadas, but Cindy specifically was asking about dogs eating them. Right. Um, so with dogs, again, as I said, there's nothing 
inherently about the cicada that's likely to cause a problem. The only things that might be issues in that way are, um, first, they do have kind of large wings that are kind of tough. And so there have been examples of dogs who have actually kind of choked on them a little bit. And the second thing is the chitin that makes up the um, cicada's exoskeleton can be difficult to digest. So sometimes if a dog's eat a bunch of them, they'll throw it up. Um, but one thing we are worried about, again, is if the cicada has been contaminated by anything or treated with something like an insecticide, that can be an issue for pets. Um, so the cicadas themselves aren't an issue, but given that there are all those other um, possible problems, if your dog eats a cicada, you, you know, you don't freak out right away, but keep track of it. And if you see something's off, do consult a vet because again, I can tell you about the cicadas, but I'm, I'm not a vet, so I can't <laughs> completely reassure you that your dog is going to be okay. Um, great. And then uh, Judge Jonathan, who I think is um, a Purdue fan or maybe even an alum, <laughs> uh, wanted to know when it will end, when the emergence will end. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we've, we've been asked this a lot too. Um, it's about a month to a month and a half. And that's again, largely weather dependent um, because if it's, you know, if it's really good for the cicadas, they might last a little longer. If it's really bad, it might only be that month period. And it's gonna depend on where you are in the state. So it depends on when it starts, but say um, if it started May 1st, for example, we wouldn't expect them to be longer than um, say mid June. That's when we'd expect them to sort of taper off and at the earliest, the end of May. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then Emily asked about, are there certain types of trees that they're more likely to be attracted to? So Dan can tell you more details about that later, but as a general rule, cicadas are extreme generalists. Um, if it's a deciduous tree, they're not picky. Uh, so they won't go after um, uh, coniferous trees or anything like that. So like your pines, your spruces should be fine, um, but they, they're they not picky. If a, leaf if a tree drops its leaves in the fall, they might try and drink from it, try and lay their eggs in it. Great, great. Now um, I'm gonna an answer this question. Uh, Jason asked, how do you sign up for the BioBlitz? And Elizabeth has shared the link that I will send to everybody. Um, at the end of the talk today. And then I'll just mention that Tanya had suggested uh, some places for Judy to take her grandkids. And also thank you, Scott. Scott shared the link to the University of Connecticut for that map. Perfect. So <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and um, there's a question from Stephanie. I'm gonna save that for a minute and let's go ahead and start with Dan. And we'll come back to Stephanie, your question and any other questions we have in the meantime. So uh, next, Dan uh, Shaver is the state forester with the Natural Resource Conservation Service here in Indiana. He has a forestry degree from Purdue University and over 25 years of experiencing managing both private and public forest land in Indiana. And during the 2004 cicada emergency, he and his young son collected hundreds of cicada shells and tried chocolate covered cicadas since they were emerging all over their property in Bartholomew County. So if you have some more questions about the edible side, I'm sure he can help you with that. Dan? Wonderful, thanks, Heather. Let me share my screen. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Yep, my name is Dan Shaver and I work with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and uh, in 2004 was really my first exposure to cicadas. They happened once before when I was younger, but I really don't remember it. So 2004 was kind of an exciting time working down in Brown County and being there for the brood X emergence in 2004. And it, uh, it did not disappoint. It was worth going uh, to see what happened and enjoying this natural phenomena. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about tree health and our tree plantings in Indiana and how they might be impacted by cicadas. Uh, I'll start out with a, a map here. Elizabeth showed a map that showed where the cicadas will emerge this year. This is another map put together by the Forest Service. It does a nice job of showing the different broods and where they will emerge across the Eastern US 
at in different years. And you can see for Indiana, it pretty much covers most of the state in Indiana and over into Ohio. There's also out into Pennsylvania, down into Tennessee, as Elizabeth mentioned, Brood X will emerge. Uh, on the left of the screen, you can see the counties listed that will kind of be the worst hit by cicadas in Indiana. And it tends to be those counties along the Ohio River and South Central Indiana up to Martinsville. That's kind of where you can expect the worst, uh, not the worst, but the most emergence. And then the rest of Indiana is gonna be spotty. You know, in Northern Indiana, there are places where you'll have a pretty significant emergence. There'll be other places where there won't be very many. Uh, and when it comes to trees and tree health, you know, it's gonna vary depending on how many cicadas emerge in your area as to how they impact your trees. So if you're in any of the counties listed on the, the left, you're gonna see a pretty healthy emergence. The rest of the state, it will be spotty, but it will be noticeable and pretty amazing. So let's get into the damage to trees. This is where we're starting to get a lot of questions. People are starting to wonder what is gonna to happen to my trees in my yard, the trees in my tree planting, uh, our flowers, our shrubs, everything else, what's gonna happen with this, this occurrence. And the damage to the trees is primarily caused by the females and their egg laying habits. So they use their ovipositor and they're gonna gouge these longitudinal slits in the twig. And you can see on the picture on the right, that they are uh, you know, kind of a divot and then a long scar and then another divot and they lay their eggs in those divots along the stem. On this picture, it shows one nice little you know, scoring from that ovipositor all the way up one side of the stem, but this is not exactly how it is when there's a million or more emerging per acre. There's gonna be multiple slips on multiple sides of this stem and you get enough physical damage that it ends up killing that stem and they basically know that cicadas like to utilize stems that are about the size of a pencil and so when we have damage on our trees it's not going to be the entire branch of that tree that gets damaged by the cicadas and their egg laying habits it's just going to be the end of the branches up to about the size of a pencil where we'll see the majority of the damage And that damage, what we can expect to see is a couple things. One is flagging. This is a term that's used when we have trees that have small individual pockets of branches or leaves that die for some reason. There's other tree diseases that can cause flagging, but with cicadas, it'll be pretty noticeable on the outside edges of the tree, the branches, you know, if they're heavily exposed to the sun, they tend to like it. You're gonna see leaves start to turn brown and then we'll have the tips of the branches die back. So there will actually be enough mechanical damage that the branches will die back six, eight, 12 inches, depending on the diameter of that branch. And that's the, the main injury that we will see to trees. In young seedlings, we'll talk about this later, but we have the potential to create multiple leaders. So if you picture a big yard tree, there tends to be a, a a dominant leader to that tree, the very topmost branch that kind of guides that tree in its growth and direction over time. Once trees get big enough, if those leaders get knocked back, it's not very significant. The tree's still gonna maintain its general shape and growth habits. But when we have young seedlings, if we lose that leader, then we get uh, lateral buds on that plant that send out, um, they start to emerge and send out shoots and we may get a different leader for that tree, which can uh, deform the tree or degrade it from a timber value if you're trying to grow your trees for timber. So losing that dominant leader is troublesome in younger trees. In mature trees, it's not that big of a deal. And so we'll tend to see this flagging throughout the tree. Some trees, it'll be very spotty. Other trees, depending on the number of cicadas, you know, the whole outer perimeter of it could be knocked back a little bit and turn brown. And so you will depending on how many cicadas, you'll have a different level of flagging that occurs on the trees in your area. I wanted to run through a couple of situations because you know, not all trees are created equal and the cicadas aren't gonna impact them the same. 
And so I wanted to go through a couple different scenarios with you that might address concerns depending on where you live and the types of trees you have around your house or property. And I'll start out with existing forest land. Uh, Elizabeth did a great job of talking about the cicada and how they are dependent on the roots of those trees for their life cycle. If the tree is removed and those roots die, that kills the cicadas that were underground feeding on them. So if you have a mature forest, existing forest land that is over 17 years old, there's a good chance that there are brood X cicadas in that woods. They're going to emerge this year. They're gonna crawl up the trunks of the trees. They're gonna begin uh, singing and mating. The females are gonna do damage to the tips of the trees. And in a mature forest, in a forest that's over 17 years old, you're not going to have that much damage in terms of mortality. The trees are pretty well adapted to cicadas. They can withstand a little bit of the damage to the outer edges of their branches and they will, uh, they will be just fine. They will continue throughout the year and grow. The only time you might get mortality is if you have a tree that is severely stressed. You know, stress in our trees tends to be a little bit cumulative. If you've had a significant drought, if you've had some changes, construction or something to a tree, and then all of a sudden you get cicadas on it and it defoliates part of it, then there's the potential for more mortality. But for the most part in our existing forest, the trees are going to be fine. They've lived with cicadas for generations. Uh, the damage caused is not typically going to end that tree's life. It'll just going to stress it a little bit. And the damage will probably be more extensive along the edges of the woods. Uh, in this picture, you can see the trees are very tall, lots of trunk, and then they have a nice crown at the top of them. So they're going to get some cicadas up there. But along the edges of the woods, where we have trees that have branches closer to the ground, more leaves on the outer edge of the tree, you may see a little bit more damage along the edges of your existing woods. But for the most part, our forest land can tolerate cicadas and is adapted to it. It's a natural occurrence. Uh, where it's not a natural occurrence is when we have a species like the emerald ash borer that came in a number of years ago and started working on our ash trees. It was not a native species. It wasn't natural. The injury that it caused to our ash, ash trees ended up killing them. And so that was pretty devastating to our forest resources, but cicadas are not in that category. They're a native insect and they're gonna emerge and have an impact, but it won't be long lasting on our forest. So how will cicadas impact the trees in our yard, our ornamental trees, our, our yard trees? It's going to depend. Again, if it's a tree that's over 17 years old and you had cicadas in 2004, you're gonna have cicadas again this year. Uh, this is a picture of a hickory tree growing down in my yard. It was there 17 years ago. It had a little bit of uh, flagging and tip dieback from cicadas, but it has a strong root system. It's got a well-balanced crown. It grew right through it and it has done fine since then. So I expect the same this year. I will get some damage. I'll have some brown leaves and some tip dieback, but this tree is gonna weather cicadas just fine. Uh, you can see there are some things that may impact your yard trees a little bit more. If you are um, in an area that you can see the woods behind the tree here, there's a lot of cicadas there. Those woods have been there more than 17 years. Uh, it's in an area of the state where cicadas, are, the brood X is pretty heavy. So they're going to find this tree. They're going to move out from the woods if there's not that many trees on this yard or cicadas on this yard tree they're gonna find it and they're gonna have some impact, but the tree should survive. If you have ornamental trees or yard trees that are less than 17 years old and they haven't been exposed to cicadas before, there's a good chance cicadas are gonna find that tree in your yard this year, especially if you have any trees older than 17 years that had cicadas in 2004, or you're adjacent to a woods that has cicadas in it. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned they don't fly very far. They're kind of lazy, but they will move out a little bit and they are going to find trees. This is a flowering crab apple in my yard, less than 17 years old. It's never had cicadas before, but it's going to get them this year, I'm sure. 
and they're going to do some damage. Again, the flagging, the tip dieback, the cicadas are going to do some damage, but if your tree is healthy, it's planted well, it's got a good root system, it is going to weather the damage and it's going to be fine. So in this case, I'm not really going to do much to this tree. There are some things I could consider. Could I spray it with some insecticide? Could I cover it? You know, those are some options that are out there. But in this case, my preference is just let the cicadas do what they will. They're going to knock back the tips of the branches. I might prune it up a little bit after the cicada damage is done. But other than that, I'm just going to let whatever happens happen to this tree because I think it's healthy and it's going to survive okay. I do want to talk a little bit about, though, about damage prevention and some of the things that you can do as a landowner or homeowner. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned that they're not picky. Cicadas like our deciduous trees. They like uh, woody shrubs. They're going to do damage. If it's a, a woody plant, there's the potential for them to do damage. And some of the research says over 200 kinds of trees that they will lay eggs on. They tend to like our native trees, our oaks, maples, and cherries, fruit trees, hawthorn, and redbud are used very commonly. They don't tend to like our uh, evergreens, the pines and the spruces. There is some evidence of them utilizing some of the native, um, oh, the cedars and the hemlocks if they're around. So you may have to watch for that just a little bit if you have those in your yard, but they don't like the evergreens as well. Insecticides is something that always comes up. People want to know about what can I spray? What can I do to treat for cicadas? When the emerald ash borer first came into Indiana, there was a fair amount of work done to treat some trees if you wanted them to survive. There were some insecticides, some systemic insecticides you could apply to the soil to try to save your ash tree. That doesn't really work that way with cicadas. Since they're not feeding on the leaves, they're not feeding on parts of the tree, those type of insecticides are not going to be effective against cicadas. There are a few sprays out there that you might be able to apply to a tree, but you have to uh, do multiple applications throughout the time they're emerging, and they're not guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be that effective. So my recommendation would be to stay away from insecticides with cicadas, that it's not worth the benefit that you're going to get from spraying. If you want to try to protect a tree, especially a small tree, you're better to go with a physical barrier. There are uh, shade cloths and plastic mesh that you can put over smaller trees. The big thing is that the openings in the mesh need to be less than a half acre or a half uh, inch so that the adult cicada cannot actually get through that physical barrier. You can see the picture on the bottom right that they just can't fit through the holes in that mesh. And so they can't get to that young tree in order to do the damage from the egg laying. So uh, physical barriers will work. But again, depending on the size of the tree and how much effort you want to go to, it may or may not be practical. Uh, with your ornamental trees, if you are planting trees this year, if you are planning to plant some trees in your yard, especially ball and burlap stuff, if there are trees that you can wait until after the cicadas have emerged to plant it, you're probably better off. If you can wait until fall to plant, that might be an option. Uh, if you've already planted that tree and invested that time, effort, and money into it, it's probably worth trying to cover it just so you don't get that heavy cicada damage before it gets a chance to establish its roots. Another situation that you might have as a landowner is an existing tree planting. If you had an open area that you planted to trees five to 10 years ago, maybe in the last five years, what do you do about that? You've got all these young trees out on the landscape. There's too many of them out there to try to protect. We already talked about that sprays and insecticides aren't that effective. So what can you do? If you have an existing tree planting that is five years older, older, it's probably going to be okay. There's going to be some cicada damage, especially if that tree plantation is located next to an existing woods. There's going to be cicadas that will move out from that woods into the tree plantation and find your seedlings. Again, it may cause some flagging and tip dieback. 
but hopefully after five years old, those trees are too big to get killed back to the root collar. So it's just gonna be the tips of the branches and they are gonna continue to grow. You may need to do a little bit of pruning within two years of the cicada damage, but if the trees are big enough, they probably won't need any assistance from you whatsoever, especially our tree plantings that may be in that 10 to 20, 30 year old range the cicada damage, it'll be there, the trees will survive, and the tree will be healthy and continue to grow with good form. If you have tree plantings that are less than five years old, there could be a little bit more damage to those little tree seedlings, especially if you are interested in uh, growing those trees for timber. If you're trying to keep that tree growing straight and tall with a single stem, if you get some cicada damage on trees less than five years old, there's a chance you'll need to do some pruning to make sure you just have one dominant leader or uh, one dominant stem if for some reason that tree would get killed back to the root collar. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Before we do that though, I wanted to touch on new tree plantations. This is probably the biggest concern that I am hearing from landowners is that they really weren't thinking about the periodical cicada being here this year. You know, just like that 17 year cycle confuses predators, it confuses us humans too because it's an odd number and it's a long enough time between emergences that we kind of forget about it. And so a lot of people plan to plant trees this year. They've ordered thousands of trees to plant on their property. They are excited to reforest in an area, an area and start growing trees for timber and wildlife and the birds. And then all of a sudden they find out cicadas are coming and the thousands of dollars they've invested in seedlings, they're wondering what's gonna happen. So this has been a big concern for us and trying to get information out to landowners because when you look online, there is a lot of information out there that says delay your planting, don't plant until after the emergence. And for foresters, that's a bit troubling because in Indiana, if you wait until June, to plant your uh, baby tree seedlings, there's a good chance we're gonna have a drought later in the summer and that's gonna be catastrophic to your seedlings. Drought is one of the biggest problems we have with our seedlings in Indiana is them getting knocked back by our late summer droughts and not being well established. And so what we are recommending to landowners that if you're planning to plant trees this spring, that do that as soon as conditions allow. And I know fortunately, uh, here in April, we have had good planting conditions. I know a lot of foresters that are already planting trees. Some of them are almost done planting trees for the spring, but the best thing to do is get those trees in the ground now. Hopefully they get planted correctly. They're, um, they start growing, they start building their roots, they start doing some top growth, and they're pretty well established before the cicadas emerge in uh, hopefully mid-May through June and those seedlings were able to tolerate the damage from cicadas. Uh, so I put a couple of notes on here. If you're planting in April and May, you're probably in pretty good shape, especially early May here in April, you're in good shape. If you're planting in May and early June, it gets a little bit dicey because your seedlings haven't had as much chance to establish their roots. They're not growing as well. And so the cicada damage could create more mortality if those seedlings haven't had a chance to be in the ground for a few weeks and establish their root systems. And those cicadas are gonna do the same thing they do to mature trees. If the stem is big enough, it's gonna cause some tip dieback. And in some young seedlings, they could actually kill those seedlings all the way down to the root collar, which is basically the level of the ground with that seedling. Uh, even if that happens, it's not the end of the world for our bare root seedlings, if they've been planted correctly and had a few weeks to establish, they should be able to send up a sprout from the root collar and reestablish themselves. And this will be something that you'll have to watch. If you planted trees this spring and you get a lot of tip dieback from cicadas, you can actually go out there and look at those seedlings after the cicadas are done singing and they're not emerging anymore and assess those seedlings and you take your fingernail or a pocket knife and kind of scratch the bark starting from the top going down towards the root collar. If that, uh, you know, once you get through the bark, if it is gray and brown, that part of the seedling is probably dead. 
If you get down closer to the root collar and you start getting into the inner bark that is green or white, that part of the stem is still alive and hopefully that seedling will be able to send out a shoot and replace itself. Uh, but it's something you'll have to keep an eye on as a landowner and hopefully the damage is no worse than what deer brows would be to new seedlings and they will, they will grow through it. Uh, if you do have multiple leaders that result, result from the cicada damage, we wanna try to get that corrected within about two years after the cicadas, uh, after this year. So about two growing seasons, we wanna to try to do that corrective pruning to make sure the tree's growing straight and without multiple leaders. And when I talk about multiple leaders, here's a picture that is an example of multiple leaders. This is a walnut seedling. Now this is not cicada damage, this is prescribed fire damage, this is in my front yard. But this little walnut seedling now has two main leaders that are growing from it. And you can see where they join. It's not a very healthy joint down here. So at some point in time, if I want to grow this tree for timber, I need to select one of these two to be the main leader. And what I am expecting this year is that cicadas are going to kill back both of the, the tips of these, these stems six or eight inches until it gets too big. The cicadas don't really want to try laying eggs on it. It's going to die back. I'm going to let it sprout, grow the rest of this summer. And then either this winter or next fall, I will come in and take off one of these leaders. So I'm going to take off the one that is not as healthy and maybe not as tall and just create a single leader so that that walnut tree can grow straight and tall and it'll send out lateral branches as it grows, but it'll have one main leader. And so that is something that is a, a landowner with a tree plantation that's fairly young. You may need to get out and do some pruning to make sure you just have one dominant leader on your seedlings. I mentioned seedlings dying back to the root collar. This is something else that could happen with your seedlings, especially if you planted this year those little seedlings could get knocked back to the root collar. This is a, a young oak seedling. Again, this is fire damage and not cicada, but it's the same type of mechanical damage. The central stem on this, this little seedling here got killed by the fire probably three years ago. And then it sprouted and sent up two sprouts from uh, lateral buds down there by the, the root collar. And you can see they're growing. They've had a couple of years to grow. The one on the right has a very low fork, is not very good form. The one on the left is fairly straight and tall and continues up to a single leader. So with this oak seedling, I'm gonna come back now and I can cut off the, uh, the stem on the right and the center one. And that will leave one single stem with a nice terminal bud and nice leader to grow into the future. And so if your seedlings die back to the root collar, you can give them this summer to recuperate and sprout again, give them next year to grow a little bit more. And then in maybe the fall of 2022, go through and uh, select the stem that you wanna grow into the future. So that doesn't sound too bad. The, the risk to our mature forest trees, the risk to mature yard trees, even some younger planted trees in our yard doesn't sound too bad, but there are some complicating factors out there. So with tree plantings especially, if we had a really wet spring and it was delaying planting, that could be bad. If we don't get our seedlings in the ground soon enough, they don't get a chance to establish and there could be more negative impacts from cicadas. Fortunately, this spring has not been too wet. From what I've heard, we're having, a, we're having a fairly decent spring. We're getting tree seedlings in the ground. That's good to help us get through this emergence in May and June. Uh, spring drought, I don't think we're, we don't have too many counties that are under drought conditions right now. So that's not negatively impacting us right now, but we still could have summer drought. If we get seedlings in the ground and after these cicadas emerge, we go into a summer drought that adds stress to these seedlings. And if you start compounding those stresses, stress from cicadas, stress from drought, then there's the chance you could have more mortality. So we're, we're hoping for a good planting season. We're hoping that we don't have a lot of drought this summer so that our young tree seedlings can survive uh, the cicada damage and grow and be healthy. 
in your tree plantings, if you have a lot of large seedlings, our black walnuts, our oaks and hickories and yellow poplars tend to be bigger seedlings. They have those stems that are pretty desirable for cicadas, about the size of a pencil. They're gonna get hit a little bit more maybe than a seedling, a, a black cherry or a persimmon that doesn't have as stout of branches and they may not get hit as much. I've already mentioned young plantings next to mature woods are pretty susceptible. And then this is kind of a specialty case, but if you are ordering grafted seedlings, which are more expensive because they have kind of common root rootstock and then a uh, better genetics, the, the top part of the plant is grafted onto the rootstock. If you're planting those grafted seedlings and you get cicada damage that kills them back to the root collar, what you're gonna get sprouting back is that common rootstock. It's not gonna be the grafted genetics that you paid for. And so if you're planting grafted seedlings, you might consider using tree tubes and nets over them to protect those more expensive seedlings. Uh, that's probably not as common a situation in Indiana, but it does happen. There are a lot of people that like to plant the higher quality grafted seedlings just with the potential growth and benefits in the future. So if that's your situation, you may need to consider some protection. And then just kind of to, to wrap up just a little bit, this is a natural phenomenon that is gonna occur here in Indiana this year. It's not gonna occur again until 2038, which is kind of crazy to think about. There may be a few other little emergences between now and then, but nothing as extensive as what we're gonna see this year. So I would encourage you to get out and enjoy it, experience it. This is kind of like the, you know, the, the solar eclipse that happened the other year and people were driving down to Kentucky and parking in parking lots just to see the solar eclipse. This is kind of like that for some people. They're gonna be heading down to our state parks and some of our natural areas where we've had trees for many, many years just to see this natural occurrence. And they seem like a pest, they seem like they're gonna cause trouble but it is really a natural process that we are, it's kind of nice that we get to experience it. And it is short lived, like Elizabeth said, there's gonna be a month or six weeks of some noisy time in the forest and some damage to our trees, but it's a pretty amazing natural event. I remember from 2004, I got specific memories of being out at Brown County State Park and every squirrel in the park was fat and happy and they would sit in the tree and run up on a branch, grab a cicada, run back down, eat it until the wings fell off and run back up and grab another one. And they just kept doing this over and over again. Uh, people that like fishing, they're already advertising lures that look like cicadas and talking about uh, the benefits to fish as the cicadas kind of clumsily crash into the surface of the water and the fish gobble them up. Our turkey populations have suffered a little bit in Indiana the last couple springs and Hopefully with, we have a good spring and we have with the cicadas, we're gonna have a kind of a boom in our turkey population. But this emergence will help moles, it'll help snakes, it'll help insects. It's, it's kind of an amazing occurrence and one that you should take the time to get out and see and enjoy it. Uh, we mentioned eating cicadas, you know, if you're feeling brave and you go online and do your research, it's, it's something worth trying. Even if it's just kind of a novelty thing, it's kind of neat to, to do that. And if you look back in some of the historical documents, uh, Native Americans and early Europeans were eating cicadas as well. So it's nothing new, but it's just something we're not as used to, but I encourage you to check it out. And there is a fact sheet uh, NRCS through the USDA. We did put out a little bit of a fact sheet that is online. If you want to check that out, the link is below. And I think there's going to be one in the chat through the Indiana Forest and Woodland Owners Association. You can find it as well. It's got some great information on the life cycle, uh, when it emerges, and the impact that it'll have on our trees. So check that out if you get a chance. And then if anybody has any questions, we're happy to take those questions. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciated that input and uh, interesting to hear what's gonna happen to our plants over the next few weeks and months. Um, if anybody has a question, please put that in the chat. Uh, we should be wrapping up soon. Um, I know we've gone a little bit past one, but, but we just have a few more questions. Um, someone asked about evergreens, but I think you answered that pretty completely. So I think we'll pass on that. And um, I lost my place. Um, 
Patricia noted she plans to cover all her baby trees that are four feet and under. She has a, a number of first year seedlings that she is going to plant in the woods this autumn. So she's gonna take a little extra protection. She wanted to know about elderberries, dogwood, shrubs, and bushes. What, what should they be covered as well? They, they are susceptible if uh, they have a woody stem and the cicadas will find them and utilize those for egg laying or try to. So there is the risk to those species. Again, if they're uh, really small diameter branches, it may have less impact. But again, think about the size of a pencil. If it's got woody branches on it about the size of a pencil, there's a good chance cicadas are gonna find it and use it for egg laying. It's a, a different method of pruning, huh? Uh, it, it will be. Becky asked, can you make the tree cover too tight? Uh, that is a good question. I do not have a whole lot of experience with actually covering trees with the netting. Uh, everything I looked at online, you know, they're trying to keep it somewhat uh, loose around the tree, but you want to make sure it covers the foliage completely and then is gathered tight around the trunk. Because again, the cicadas can fly and land on that tree and they can also kind of climb their way up the trunk. And so if, if you have gaps in that netting, underneath it or around the stem, there's a good chance they're gonna find their way in. Chris said, you mentioned that this is more an issue for mature trees if they are under stressed. Last year, many of our oaks experienced leaf damage due to the late frost. And then we had an oak leaf miner outbreak and some drought conditions. So I suspect many of those trees are stressed. Are you concerned we could have some oak die off in our forests over the next few years due to these combined stresses? If so, is there anything we can do to help our mature forests? The, uh, the question foresters hate most is when is that tree going to die? Because we, it's a big secret. We don't tell you this, but we really don't know. Uh, trees, mature trees that look healthy can suddenly blink out. You know, there's some diseases that we can identify and know that a tree is stressed, but it is really difficult to say how a mature tree is going to handle this if it's had future or previous stress from drought or other factors. Uh, and that stress is a bit cumulative. After our major droughts, we had a big drought in 2012 and there were still trees, you know, up to just a few years ago that we were still dying from that drought in 2012. And for some of those trees, this damage from cicada could be what pushes it over the edge and it no longer survives. But there's not a lot we can do for, especially our mature trees in our forest. The big thing we promote is of, with foresters is to keep our woods healthy. So if you have a forest and you are doing, uh, you know, some thinning to keep your trees healthy and growing well, and that tree is in a position, it's got a full crown, it's more likely to weather these type disturbances than if it is overcrowded and stressed. And so just good forest management practices help make your forest more resilient to these types of disturbances. Great. Courtney said, we have multiple tree plantings planned this year. We are we're talking 1,000 plus trees at a time. Any suggestions on what we can tell customers when they call us in a bit of a panic? Yeah, I would, uh, you know, you can always share that fact sheet with them. And the advice that we are getting from our forest health specialists in Indiana is to get those trees in the ground as soon as possible, get them established so that their roots have a chance to begin growing, they have a chance to start uh, putting on some shoot growth. And then hopefully if the cicadas do damage them, it will just be down to the root collar. But this is something that landowners are gonna have to keep an eye on. And, you know, establishment might go great this year and they may end up with a little more, more mortality next year than they expected and have to do a little bit of replanting. But most of the experts are saying, if you get them in the ground and well-established, they will sprout back next year and you should not have to replant. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have for Dan. I'm gonna turn it over to Heather who uh, has a few more questions in the, in the queue. Yes, I think uh, Stephanie asked a question at 1230 and I promised her we'd get it answered. Um, I think it's a great question. So it's really for you, Elizabeth, um, I think. So how do, you, uh, how do the cicadas make the mud chimney if they don't come out of the ground until it rains? Do they dig out and then go back in and wait? Yeah, so they'll, they'll dig up kind of close to the surface and then they'll retreat a little bit further back into the burrow. Um, 
if if it's not quite the right temperature. So you know how you get days that are sort of the with the warmer days, and so they'll kind of creep up to the surface, and then you'll get a cold day, and they'll go nope, 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 too cold, <laughs> and they'll go back down. Uh, when I was out uh, this weekend, there was actually one cicada that I saw that was like desperately trying to dig back down because his um, the the hole that it had been in had collapsed a little bit, and it was decided that it was too cold. It was trying to get back down again. So yeah, that's how, that's why you'll see those little chimneys before the cicadas actually have emerged fully. Well, great. Are there any other questions? We just have, we have run over, um, but if there's anything else, you can type it in the chat box real quick. Um, in the meantime, I'll share that uh, Liz did post the uh, flyer that Dan shared at the end. The link to that is in the chat box. Also, the link to that will be in the email I'll send you all. Uh, we do have one other question. I think this might be for Dan. Will prescribed fire impact the cicadas? It really should not. Most of the science on prescribed burning and prescribed fire shows that uh, fire has very little impact on soil temperatures. So it's consuming the leaf litter, it's consuming some of the vegetation, but if those cicadas are even just still a, you know, an inch or so underground, the temperature from that fire, the heat from the fire is not gonna change that soil temperature and impact them. So I would expect very little impact uh, from prescribed fire on cicadas at this time of year. Okay. And I think that one more question, uh, Danielle said, we have hundreds and hundreds of small holes we assumed were cicadas coming out, but now I don't think that's what they are. Is there something else, Elizabeth, that you might think they could be, or it's too early, not too cool, right? Um, well, I mean, it, it might be cicadas. So if you think about like kind of the size of your thumb, I think is a, a good estimate, or even your... Um, pinky finger, I, I picked one up and I had it on my pinky finger. I didn't share that picture, um, but that's about the size of the, the, the range of the size for the holes. Um, if it's really small, I mean, it could be worms. There are some burrowing beetles that it could even be, although I would, I would tend towards maybe worms. Um, you know, if it's really big, that could be a, a different type of animal. So something like a mole. Um, She's saying about quarter size. About quarters, well, it could be cicadas. That could very well be cicadas. Um, if you kind of look down into, if you've got a lot of them and there are trees nearby and um, it might be cicadas and especially if you've never seen it there before, if this is kind of unusual and you haven't encountered it before. Um, so I would suggest, you know, you can get a flashlight. You can kind of look down into the holes, see if you spot any um, little red eyes staring <laughs> back at you. Uh, that yeah, yeah, it could be cicadas. I mean, I can't guarantee it, but that might be what it is. Well, that sounds great. That's good. I hope they are cicadas, Danielle. <laughs> um, well, I think we'll end here. We are over, but I uh, do, on behalf of Liz and myself, want to thank you and Elizabeth and Dan for great presentations. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended. And I hope you all get out and enjoy the sights and sounds that are coming our way anytime now. Thanks.